promissory estoppel is one of the types of contracts that we discussed previously. A case that illustrates promissory estoppel is Hoffman v. Red Owl Stores, decided by the Wisconsin Supreme Court in 1965. Let's have a look at the facts first. Hoffman, the plaintiff in this case, operated a bakery. In addition to running the bakery, he wanted to obtain a supermarket franchise with a business called Red Owl Stores, the defendant. Red Owl Stores told Hoffman that his $18,000 that he had available in capital was sufficient. However, as a first step before running a Red Owl franchise store, Red Owl advised Hoffman to acquire and operate a smaller local convenience store to gain experience and prepare him for running a larger Red Owl store. Hoffman followed the advice and purchased and ran a smaller convenience store. Three months later, Red Owl stores came back to Hoffman. Red Owl advised Hoffman to sell his current, smaller store and gave assurances that he would be given the opportunity to purchase the franchise for a Red Owl store that he desired. It was spring and Hoffman was reluctant to miss the summer tourist season. Nevertheless, he sold the store based on Red Owl's assurances. Another few months passed and Red Owl told Hoffman that everything is ready to go and that he should get his money together in order to prepare for the purchase of the franchise. Red Owl also told Hoffman that he needed more funds than initially advised. It suggested that in order to raise the rest of the financial contribution, Hoffman should sell the baker that he owned and had operated in addition to the grocery store. Again, Hoffman followed this advice and sold the bakery for $10,000. Given the rush sale, the bakery was sold at a loss of $2,000. Subsequently, Red Owl informed Hoffman that he would have to contribute an even greater amount of money to purchase the store franchise. To that end, Red Owl agreed to permit Hoffman's father-in-law to contribute $13,000 and become a partner in the store. However, the parties were ultimately unable to come to an agreement, with Hoffman becoming increasingly frustrated with Red Owl's changing demands and conditions. The negotiations broke down completely. Hoffman sued Red Owl for reliance damages, lost profits, and expenses. When the case reached the Wisconsin Supreme Court, there were two legal issues to decide. First, whether Hoffman could invoke promissory estoppel. And second, assuming that Hoffman was able to rely on promissory estoppel, what remedies should apply? In terms of the first issue, the court relied heavily on Section 90 of the Restatement First of Contracts, which was in place at the time. This section outlines the requirements for estoppel. It provides that a promise which the promisor should reasonably expect to induce action or forbearance of a definite and substantial character on the part of the promisee, and which does induce such action or forbearance, is binding if injustice can be avoided only by enforcement of the promise. What this means is that the requirements for promissory estoppel to apply are, first, there is a promise which the promisor should reasonably expect to induce action or forbearance, which is of a definite and substantial character. Second, that the promise did induce such action or forbearance, that is, that there was reliance on the promise, and third, that injustice could be avoided by enforcement of the promise. Applying these rules to the facts, the court held for Hoffman and awarded damages. The court found that injustice would result if Hoffman was not allowed relief because he relied to his detriment on promises which Red Owl failed to keep. Hoffman's stretchment was the sale of the bakery at a loss, costs incurred in the process of negotiating with Red Owl and others. 
The promise that he relied on was Red Owl's statement that he would be given a franchise. In terms of the remedy, however, the court took a restrictive approach. The court decided that when damages are awarded in promissory estoppel, they should only be such as are necessary to prevent injustice. That means that they should compensate for the plaintiff's change in position, but they should not enforce the promises made and the damages should not exceed actual loss. In the case at hand, the damages awarded were limited to the difference between the sale price for Hoffman's bakery and his smaller store compared to the fair market value of the assets that he sold. That is, Hoffman was able to claim damages to the extent that his sale resulted in a loss because had he not been forced to sell as to finance the expected purchase, he would have achieved a better price. Yet the court held that there should be no damages for lost profits. Hoffman was therefore not allowed to claim damages based on profits that he had missed out on due to the sale of his existing bakery and store. Neither was he allowed to claim for the loss of profits that he expected to make as a result of operating the larger Red Owl store for which he was trying to purchase the franchise. In certain ways, the decision is logical and makes sense given that a promissory contract is not a contract in the technical sense. Thus, promises that could be enforced in a real contract cannot be enforced in this type of pre-contractual relationship. On the other hand, there is the question whether the court's restrictive approach really avoids injustice. A more generous approach would have allowed the party that changed its position in reasonable reliance on a promise to recover not only the costs it incurred in doing so, but lost profits as well.